God has really been good to us. And I had a decision to make years and years ago after I trusted Christ as my Savior. Would I or would I not serve the Lord? And I really had a struggle because I wanted to do something for the Lord but didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to find the will of God for my life. And the Bible talks about winning and losing. And I want to win. I don't want to be a loser. I know that when I get to heaven, I, I don't want my heavenly father to be ashamed of me. And I don't want to be ashamed before him at his coming. I had a, a father-in-law that loved me enough to tell me some things to do and not to do. And he made the statement about, don't say something that you don't want to be saying when the Lord comes. He said, and don't be doing something you don't want to be doing when the Lord comes. Well, that just about covered everything. He said, and don't be anywhere you don't want to be when the Lord comes. Oh, that even made it narrower. But it did make an impact upon my life. So I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Mark and chapter 8. The book of Mark, chapter 8. What can the believer lose? In other words, if I serve the Lord, what's in it for me? Well, what can I lose if I don't? There is always, and you need to understand, there's a price to pay. A price to pay. So in the decisions that we make, and no one can make you serve the Lord. No one can make you love God. So there's things that you need to understand because life here upon this earth is temporal. It is passing quickly. God is the author of life and he granted us life and there is an appointed time in which we're going to die. There's an appointment and uh, we don't know when that's going to be. And God hasn't told all of us the exact day when we're going to die. But I believe life can be shortened by disobedience and prolonged by obedience. And sometimes by your obedience, God may, just like with Stephen's in the Bible, cause you to go home early. Uh-oh. So we don't know when. All we're supposed to do is be faithful. So here in the book of Mark chapter 8, verse 34... It says, when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, also he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, anytime you have it where you got to take up something, do something, follow something, that, that's, that's, that's service. Salvation is only receiving. You just receive. But there is a responsibility for God's children to take up the cross, that responsibility, that burden, whatever it is God wants you to crucify yourself on and serve the Lord. And make sure that you know, he's number one in your life. And so God's word teaches this. And then look what he says in verse 35. For whosoever shall save his life, or will save his life, shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So God has given you life, and God did that. It's a grant on loan from God. It's not Rush Limbaugh. It's your life is on loan from God. So he's the one who knew when you would be born and when you will die. And since you trusted Christ as your Savior and you're God's child, you're going to heaven when you die, you're not there yet. So God's Word says if you will lose your life for his sake and the gospel, the same shall find it. In other words, define the purpose of life. Why did God give you life? The ability to live. Now, it is possible that, you know, before I was born, I never thought about all those people who had been born and lived and died before I got here. Before I was born. I didn't exist. I wasn't around. I don't know what went on. If I had never been, it wouldn't have hurt me at all. But I am here. I'm here. I didn't choose that. You didn't choose that. But God has granted you the opportunity that's very unique to live. 
And then he tells us how he wants you to live upon this earth. And it's for his honor and for his glory. A man who seeks to live for himself, to find his own purpose and plan and goal in life, God says you will lose your life. Now you may live 50, 60, 70 years, but you lost your life. The purpose of the life is gone. It's not why God put you here. You blew it. It doesn't matter if you're a millionaire. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank, or the house you live in, the cars you drive. It doesn't matter about your family. Thinking. As far as the reason for God allowing you to live, if it wasn't for Him, you messed up. You blew it. You may have good health, accomplish a lot, but did you do what God wanted you to do with your life? He says, the man that will lose his life for his sake and the gospel, the same shall find it. And most people never, I don't believe, ever get there. Never find out, what did God create me for? What is the will of God for me? And the will of God is not whatever you will it to be. It's God's. And look what he says in verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, lose his own soul or his life, the purpose of his life? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, here you are, God giving you the opportunity to live. What did you exchange it for? We're always making trades. We're always trying to find a good deal. Uh, the other day was up there at the, um, the music store, and we're trying to buy some things, and we're trying to, you know, we want a good deal. Can I get the, I says, uh, can I get an old man's discount? Senior citizen discount? Triple A card discount? Uh, you know, I even got a, a card in my wallet for a, a medical thing. Whatever. We always want a deal. We want to pay as little as we can for, for as much as we can get. Uh, that's just good business. But whenever you traded your life, the one that God had for you, you gave that up. For what? Now, if you don't serve the Lord, it means you traded that for something. What did you get? What have you got so far? It, because, you see, you might have made a bad deal. You see, God has something for you, and if you do what He says, you're making an eternal investment by which God is going to bless you and reward you for eternity. Now, did you give all that up? And if you did give it up, yeah, what did you get for it? What did you give it up for? Did you know you can give all that up for a pretty little woman? You can give it up for a, a hunk. You can give all that up for, for, for this job or for fame and honor and glory. You name it. What did you trade it for? Did you make a good deal? Because whatever you traded something eternal for something temporal... I think you messed up. I think you blew it. So you want to find out what is the will of God for my life. That's more important. Now, I want you to take your notes there and look at number one. Because you need to understand that if you do not serve the Lord, now you don't have to, but you're making a trade. You're changing something for something. You're exchanging. Like you said, what did a man give in exchange so he makes a statement about the rewards. Take your Bible, look into 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. I want you to see this very quickly. 1 Corinthians and chapter 3. You'll notice in chapter 3, a verse 14. See, after you trust Christ as Savior, you're on the foundation, which is Christ. And one day, when we get to heaven... God is going to reward you for what was built on the foundation. It means after you had trusted Christ as Savior, you're saved by grace. So going to heaven is free. It's a gift. It's not a result of uh, any good works that you've done. But once you have trusted Christ, God left you here and granted you the right as a child of God to live for Him. God set you free so that you could voluntarily choose to serve Him. And if you will serve him, God says you're going to have rewards when you get to heaven. So he says here in verse 14, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, on that foundation, he shall receive a reward. 
And if in verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Nothing but salvation because you didn't do anything for him. You mean a man can trust Christ as Savior and not do anything for the Lord? Yes, that's what he says. You didn't do any works. So when you get to heaven, you can suffer the loss of rewards. And those rewards is what God wanted to give to you. You see, you have no idea how much your rich heavenly father wants to do for you and give to you. But you won't let him. You deny him the right to give to you something that he wants to do for you. Because you traded that for something that was temporal. Did you know that you can lose your testimony that quick over something that's pittance? They say that you can make a mountain out of a molehill. The difference between a molehill and a mountain is dirt. Just more of it. It's just dirt. Would you trade all that God has for you for something down here that's temporal? It's a bad move. Bad choice. You're supposed to be wiser than that. You see, just because you have ability to accomplish a lot in this world and you're looked up to and you're respected, all that, are you rich toward God? Are you laying up treasure in heaven? And so God's Word says that this is what we ought to do. But you're going to lose something. If you don't serve the Lord, you're going to lose. You're going to lose these rewards. Now, in Matthew, we don't take the time to turn there, but it says... If you bring unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, ye shall in no wise lose your reward. Uh, Matthew 6 says, lay up treasure in heaven where you can't lose it. So rewards, once they're earned, laid up in heaven, I don't believe you can lose those. But you can lose what you could have had. You could have done so much, but you limited yourself. You robbed yourself. Now, there's a lot of thieves in this old world, but it ain't a shame when a man robs himself, steals from himself, inflicts himself, tortures himself. And the Bible talks about pure love, true love, casteth out fear, because fear brings torment. And a lot of people who don't love God and His Word, they torture themselves. Because they robbed themselves of the peace and the joy and the love and the happiness that they could have in life. God designed all of this and his way will work. And when you go against it, it won't work. Uh, 1 John chapter 1. I want you to look over there quickly. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. It's on page 1321 in an old Schofield reference Bible. And you'll notice... This, this book talks about fellowship. Uh, what it boils down to, like two fellows in a ship. You, 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 you got to get together and you got to go in the same direction. If one goes that way and one goes that way, you can't go anywhere. And the Bible talks about how can two walk together unless they're agreed. So you're talking about two people going in the same direction. Well, one's God and one's me. God doesn't change directions. If I want to walk with God, guess who has to change directions? I do. Now, there are some people who get a lot of things all mixed up. Uh, they say that if you are walking this direction, and we were just talking about this the other day, um, about repentance. If you're walking this direction, they say repent means you've got to turn and go the other way, and then God will save you. You've got to stop doing all these bad things and live differently, and you've got to make this promise, commitment to God, in order for Him to save you. That's not true. That is not true. But for the Christian, it is the will of God that his children depart from iniquity. It's not the way God wants us to live. God wants us to live a holy life. And so he talks about us walking. See there in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk, it has to deal with our walk. You see, I've been teaching in the book of Ephesians about the wealth of the believer and the walk of the believer. The wealth that we have in Christ because of our standing in him that doesn't change. But the walk of the believer from day to day, well, it it changes. And one day you might be walking close to the Lord, and the next day you might be questions and doubts and fears and all kind of stuff. Well, God says, walk with Him. And if a Christian doesn't walk with the Lord, 
you're going to forfeit the fellowship that you could have with God. So remember, there is going, it's going to cost you not to put God first in your life. Now, nobody can make you do this. Nobody can make you love him. The reason that I love church is because God loves church. And when I say church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about God's people. God, the Bible says Christ gave himself for the church. He loves the church, the people. And so whenever we say we love the Lord, but we don't love his people, we got a problem. God says, you don't really love me. Because if you don't love those that you can see, how can you say you love me whom you can't see? And he says, if you love me, love one another. So we're supposed to love each other, and that means we're supposed to get together, as the Bible says, the church came together. So there's always a few mavericks, you know, that likes to just do whatever they want to do and roam wherever they want to roam, and that no commitment to anybody or anything or nobody, they just do whatever they want to do. That's not the will of God. Now, you can do whatever you want, but there's a price to pay. So God wants us to have fellowship with him. We walk with him and talk to him. You're going to forfeit that. Now, you think that's worth it? I mean, we're talking about God, our Heavenly Father. And you would give that up for the things of the world, the ways of the world? It's, it's, a, it's a costly thing. It's not a very wise move. Look at number three. Number three. I want you to look, first of all, in Galatians, the book of Galatians. I want you to see, because you need to know that if you decide, I'm not going to serve the Lord, I'm not going to change my life and do what God wants me to do, what it's going to cost you. It's, it's, it's a very expensive move. And if you're willing to pay that price, so be it. But don't whine and cry and pine about it later. You ask for it. Now, you've got to make up your mind, and one day you're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, and the Bible says, and God will wipe away all tears from our eyes, because I believe there's going to be quite a few tears. When you see what you could have done for the Lord, what you could have been for the Lord, what you could have accomplished for the Lord. Somebody asked me a question just right before church about, what about those who have never heard? Remember, Christ says, lose your life for my sake and the Gospels. And the God. I believe Hank Lindstrom gave his life for the gospel's sake. He was about souls. He just didn't want people to go to hell, and that's, that's what drove him. He was a gospel-driven man. And about those that had never heard, listen, when those people down in Nineveh, didn't God send a soul winner? And whenever you had the flood coming upon the earth, didn't God send Noah, a pre preacher of righteousness? Didn't he send Enoch? And the Bible says, a preacher, and he tells us a little bit about what he preached. You see, God has had his preachers all the time, and they went all over. And who knows what God did not reveal. But I believe that God wants to use you. And you may find out when you get to heaven, God said, you know, if you'd have served me, you could have shook this country, or this country, or this country. And you say, well, I didn't have any talent and any abilities. God says, you ought to see what I was going to do when I was going to work on you. You ought to see what I could have built out of your life. But you didn't trust me. You didn't believe me. You did your own thing. Now, this is what you could have had. And this is what you got. I believe it's going to be a wake-up call, but it's too late to wake up. And there are going to be regrets. I don't believe we'll be happy with that, but that's the way it is. There's going to be a price to pay. Look there in verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and so on. These things right here, if you decide to walk in the flesh, you're going to exchange the fruit of the Spirit for the works of the flesh. Now look at the works of the flesh. In verse 19, works of the flesh are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, various emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, and reveling, and such like. That is what you can trade, verse 22 and 23 for. But do you think it's a good move? You think it's a good move? Good exchange? Whenever I give my wife some money, which is rare, when I give her some money, she goes and she spends and she comes home. I'd like to know, what, what did you get? 
What did you get? My wife always finds bargains. She finds the best deals. That's how she got me. I was 50% off. <laughs> Don't laugh. Some of y'all are the same way. Like this one guy said to this girl, he says, um, you know, I have a half a mind to get married. She says, that's all it takes. Some of y'all won't even get that. Because you have, never mind, I'm going to just stop right there. But you're trading something for something. And you want to try to make the best decisions you can in your life. And if you've already made some bad decisions, well, what should you do? Keep making more bad decisions. No. You correct the problem. Did you know the perfect will of God for your life is as close as the next decision you make? And the wicked life can begin with the next decision you make. So it is important, the decisions that you and I make. Uh, I want you to take your Bible and look in the book of Psalms 51. All the way over there to the Old Testament. Psalms 51. Now, most everybody has heard of King David. And everybody loves King David. Because King David, well, he would never do anything wrong. He was a man after God's own heart. And um, he just sat around all day long, singing to the sheep and playing his harp. Well, the, the old boy, he grew up one day. Became the king of Israel. And when it was time to go to war, he says, I feel tired today. And that old lazy boy sure looks good. So he stayed home. And he... Got up and he looked out the window and lo and behold, he saw something he shouldn't have seen and wouldn't have seen if he hadn't have been there. The Bible talks about not making provision for the flesh, not making opportunities to get in trouble. And it's one thing for a blackbird to fly over your head. But when you let that bird land in your head and build a nest and lay eggs, you could have stopped that. You may not... Stop all the bad thoughts from coming through your little mind. But when you let that little thought stay there and harbor there and live there and dwell there and hatch there, now you went too far. Because your way you think is going to control the way you act sooner or later. And your evil thinking can get you into trouble sooner or later down the road. Now nobody's perfect, and you know that, but just because nobody's perfect isn't a means for you to see how unperfect you can be. And then use that as an excuse. Well, nobody's perfect. Of course nobody's perfect. But God still expects his children to be godly. And so he gives us a way of dealing with these problems. And one of the things is abstain from every appearance of evil. But what did David do? Well, he didn't do anything really wrong. He just asked her if she wanted to see the inside of his palace. And lo and behold, it got worse after that. He probably thought, now, it'll never go any further than this. Hello. And she said, hello, big boy. <laughs> and he went, blah, 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 And ruined his testimony. He had a man killed. He committed adultery. And then he, <laughs> he tried to get somebody else in trouble. And all of this, and Prophet Nathan came and says, Thou art the man. You're the man. I think that's the first time they've come across it. Hey, you're the man. <laughs> you're the man. And he didn't want to be the man, but he was the man. He was caught. God knew. God told on him. Ooh. And it doesn't matter if nobody sees what you do under the cover of darkness. God sees and God says, be sure your sin will find you out. It's like a detective. And it will be revealed. Sooner or later, God has a, a ways and means committee. David felt bad, lost his son, and he had such remorse. And it makes this statement here in the book of Psalms 51. He says... In, in verse 
this is where he kind of comes clean with the Lord. Look in verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. In other words, all these flashbacks, couldn't get rid of it, the guilt, it's all there. For I acknowledge my transgression. Verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified uh, when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Because when God has to judge a person, God has to be clear. He has to do right. He has to do according to the law. His word is his guide. God gave the word and he has to go by the word. So he says in verse 5, he says, I, I, was, I was born in sin. I, I, I had a a sinful nature. I, I was shaped this way. Uh, I got that from my mom. I was shaped because and my mother did conceive me. He says, you desire truth in the inward part. Now he says in verse 7, uh, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Ever heard that song? Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Good song. Well, this is where it comes from. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Because of the way he began to feel because of the sin. Now, the pleasure of sin he enjoyed. There is pleasure in sin. If it wasn't pleasurable, people wouldn't do it. But there's a price to pay down the road. And he wasn't thinking down the road, just like a lot of God's people. Said, Boy, I'll never commit adultery. Boy, I'll never do this, and I'll never do that. Yeah, but you're not walking with God. Just because you didn't rob a bank doesn't mean you're, well, I'm okay. No, no. If you're not doing what God says do, it's just as bad. Are you doing what God says do? Are you a soul winner? Do you study God's Word? Do you talk to Him? Do you want God's will for your life more than anything else in the world? So there's a, there's a problem. So he says in verse 12, Restore unto me my salvation. No, restore the joy. The joy. See, it cost. He doesn't have the joy. He, he forfeited that. The peace. Now he has sleepless nights. And you ought to read another psalm. We don't have time to go there. But it goes down. And he says, uh, the, what the Lord wants, look down there in verse uh, uh, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou will not despise. That's what God's after. God wants his children yes, to realize that when you mess up, you messed up. But don't stay there. Correct the problem. You fall in the mud, don't stay in the mud. If we confess our sins as a child of God, he is faithful and just to forgive. And they cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And whenever you confess those things to the Lord, now you can restore the walk. If you restore the walk, you restore your fellowship. You see, you don't confess your sin and it restores your fellowship. No, that's not true. That's what some guy named R.B. Thiem teaches, and I despise the teaching. I don't know if you ever heard of the guy or not, but that's a teaching, and it's not good and it's not true. So the Bible tells us, there's things that it's going to cost you. And are you willing to pay that price? Uh, look there in uh, number five in your notes there, because number four I've already covered when I opened up the, the message. In uh, number five, I want you to look in Philippians in chapter two. The book of Philippians and chapter two. Here we have the Word of God telling us how to think, how to think. And in chapter 2, if you'll notice there in verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. In other words, this is how Christ thought. And it also makes a statement in the book of Hebrews in chapter 12 of that, um, like Christ looking beyond the cross, endured the shame because of the joy. He was looking beyond, looking down the road. You see, Christ, when he came into the world and down the cross to pay for all of our sins, his vision didn't stop at the cross. He was looking beyond the cross. He knew what this payment would accomplish. And what it would accomplish was worth his death. You and I, there's things that happens in our life, and you have to look beyond the sufferings that a godly man may have to go through because you know it'll be worth it. Because you look beyond this life. 
If, you, if your vision extends no further than this world, you will never serve God. You have to look into eternity, the way it's going to be forever. This is temporary here. And that is what helps you to guide your decisions now. So here in Philippians in chapter 2, because of the way that you should think, it's supposed to affect our life. So look in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now this is not talking about how to get to heaven. This is talking about being delivered from the things that will try to destroy you in this life. Because we live in a crooked and perverse generation, as you'll see down there in verse 5, or 15. So God wants you and I to realize we're not working for our salvation, we're working out our salvation. See, God has saved you, given you eternal life. And because of that, he's left you and I here. And there's things in this world that want to destroy us. God wants to deliver us from the power of the present evil age. And that's by our walking with him and accomplishing what he wants us to do with our lives. For it is God that worketh in you, as he says in verse 13, to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, there's things in life that may not bring you at the moment this good pleasure. But let's just project ourselves into the future. Now we're in the kingdom. And you, you see now what God was talking about. And how God is using you and all the wonderful things like a paradise upon the earth. And the honor that's been bestowed upon you. And the position of leadership or whatever it might be. The reward, the crowns, whatever. You'll be so glad you did. But you might have in the back of your mind, I wish I'd have, I wish I'd have done more. I bet you will never say, I wish I'd have done less. But you will probably say, I wish I'd have done more. If you don't say it, you probably will think it. About what I could have done. And how many opportunities we did miss. And he makes a statement here in verse 15. That ye may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God, get this, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. If you do not serve the Lord the way God wants you to serve the Lord, then in this world you still will live, but you will not shine as the light of the world. See, to be the light in this world that God wants you to be, he's talking about the will of God being fulfilled in your life. But let's say you don't do it for whatever reasons. Maybe you got mad at the preacher. Mad at a deacon. Mad at somebody. And I'll never darken the doors again. And I'm not going to serve the Lord. And I don't support missionaries. And I don't support anything. And I don't go get involved in anything. I don't do anything like that. All I do is criticize. Because somebody made me mad one day. All right. Was it worth it? What you gave up. For all that bitterness. Was it worth it? You robbed yourself. You hurt you. You did it to yourself. Nobody did anything to you. You did it all to yourself. Nobody can stop you from serving God. Nobody can stop you from getting rewards in heaven. Nobody can stop you from being used in the kingdom of God. In whatever position, you did it to yourself. You robbed yourself. You traded it all. You exchanged it for something down here that was temporal. You let a little hardship, a little hatred, a little bitterness get under your skin and ruin you and keep you from serving God to the maximum. Am I getting across? Are y'all following me? I hope so. I hate to preach for an hour and nobody get a thing I'm saying. Now look at verse 16. Holding forth the word of life. 
that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And there's going to be some people that are run, they're, ho- they're going to use their whole life, and they lived in vain. They ran it in vain. They accomplished nothing. Now, that's a choice. Nobody can make you dedicate your life to God. Now, Betty's dad helped me to understand some of these things 50 years ago. And I decided as a little old brat in Georgia, I never finished high school. I finished the 10th grade. The reason I didn't go in 11th grade, my dad was still there. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, never, I never finished. I murdered the English language. All the double negatives you listen. Man, I was, it was terrible. I'm the least of any person should ever be used. But I'm so thankful that God can use me. And I'm glad that 50 years ago, and I have no regrets today, that I made a decision one day. I was sitting there in the church. And the choir, at the end of the service, they all sung the song. And the name of the song was, I I Surrender All. I sat there like a a little baby, and I, I cried. I surrender all. Whatever I am, whatever I have, whatever I can be, I surrender to God. Whatever God wants, you're free to do with me anything you want because I have made a mess out of my whole life. I'm not very smart. I'm not very wise. But I want God's will for my life. Maybe he can do something with me. You ever seen people that you think that nobody can do anything with them except God? God's going to have to work in their life. God did a work on me. Not just in me. He did a work on me. And he's probably working on all of you. When he loves you, he won't let you go. He's not going to just let you go. He's going to work on you and in you so that he can work through you. Look at the other scripture here. In the book of uh, number 6 on the spiritual insight, look here in the book of Second Peter. Second Peter, there's a couple of them that I want to show you right here. Well, three points really. Because this is, this is so good. Second Peter... And chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, page 13, 17 in a Bible that was loaned to you. Because there's some things that you need to see. You will be barren if you don't serve the Lord. You're going to trade for something. You're exchanging something. And you think you're getting away with it because there's a little pleasure in this old world. And you'll trade all those eternal things for this little moments of pleasure. Look down in verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, a lot of God's children, they are barren. They're fruitless. They have eternal life. They're going to heaven when they die. But no, a lot of people never led anybody to Christ. Never even talked to anybody. If you don't know what to do, at least pass out a track. Plant seeds. Sowing seeds on purpose. Remember the story of Ruth? Sowing seeds on purpose. Or you've you got a reason for doing it. A farmer sows his seeds on purpose. Why? He wants something to grow. Christian sows seeds. And all you're doing is planting a seed. The internet service, wherever it goes, we want the seed, the Word of God. We want to plant seeds. To the youth ministry or the little kids or, you know, everything that we have. Every, a lot of you individuals are soul winners. You talk to people. You got track. I, I was with uh, Gary Stephan the other day. We played a game of golf. And I mentioned something to this man about... I don't know. I can't even remember what it was. But anyway, I opened up a conversation and started talking about the Lord a little bit. And it wasn't long before Gary Stephan stepped right in it and robbed me. <laughs> no, but he, he, he gave the man a couple of CDs. And, uh, you know, the, 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 they're not the cheapest thing in the world. He gave him CDs of my sermons that I preached. He, he said after a year and a half, he, he, he found one good one. So he's, he, he was given, but then he started talking to him, and it wasn't long. He, he led the guy to the Lord. Now, I, I like it when people in the church, you know, they talk to people about the Lord. 
And no chance. I mean, there's probably a whole bunch of y'all in here that you will do that. God is going to reward you for that. It might seem like a little thing, but to the person who trusts Christ as Savior, when he dies and goes to heaven, boy, is he going to be thankful for the person who told him. Wouldn't you? If you in this room know you have eternal life, aren't you thankful for the person who shared that with you? What if they hadn't have done it? But they did. Somebody wanted you under the sounds of the gospel so bad. You'd be surprised what some people would do. Because they do care. And you don't want to be barren. You want to be a fruitful tree. Oh, look at verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Did you know that if you don't serve the Lord the way God wants you to, and your vision is only for this world, then you can't see afar off. So that would mean you are what? Nearsighted? If you can only see up close, and you can't see out there, then God says because you can only see here, and you can't see there, then you're blind. Now you may have 20-20 vision, but you can't see what God's saying. You don't understand. And that's why you do what you do, and you live your life the way you do, and it's a haphazard. It's whatever you want to do. There's no commitment. There's no solidarity in your life. Because you can't see in eternity. God says you're blind. You can't see very far. And where there is no vision, the people what? The people perish. Because you don't have a vision. And then look in verse 10. Wherefore the rather, he says, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. If you fall in serving the Lord, it was a choice. Falling is a choice because you can keep from falling is that we're weak sometimes and we're not strong Christians like we are and we mess up we have an old sinful nature he lies to us deceives us lifts our head full of pride look who I am how great I am what I can do and and we sometimes forget God says he has chosen the weak things of the earth the base things because God says that no flesh shall glory in his presence. That's why he made salvation a gift. So that no man can take credit for it. So that no man can say, look, look what I've done. Look who I am. Christ says, without me you can do zero. So if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior... God is not going to save you if you promise to stop some bad things or start doing some good things. Forget that. It's not a sin issue. He's already paid for your sins. All that you need to do, all that you have to do, is believe that when he died on that cross, he paid for yours. When you believe he paid for your sins, he puts that death payment to your account, and you get to go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for you. See, we're all born into this world with an old sinful, na old sinful nature. And all of our sins come from its old sinful nature. And God says, even to his children, when you become blind and you can't see afar off, he says in the last part there of verse 9, he says, have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins or the sins that comes because of the old nature. You forget, God saved you. You'd believe, believe, be surprised how... You can lose your confidence and lose your faith. The Bible talks about your faith being shipwrecked. And he talks about Hymenus and Philetus, how they overthrew the faith of some. In other words, the people don't know what to believe anymore. Because see, unless you stay strong in the Word of God, you are not going to be very strong in this world as a child of God. So that's why you need to study, to be found faithful, to do right. Because if you don't, you're exchanging all this good security, this peace and the joy and the happiness, the purpose. You're trading all of that for something temporal that won't amount to a hill of beans. And a hundred years from now, won't be worth a quarter. Be wise. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. And God will bless you for doing so. I want to give you one last verse in closing. Look there in Second Timothy. In chapter 3. 2 Timothy in chapter 3. 
<laughs> and I want you to look at one verse, verse 12. To me, this is a very important, important, important part, a point I want to make. In verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Did you know that if you choose not to live godly as a child of God, you forfeit the right, the honor, the privilege of suffering for Christ? Think about it just for a second. He said, all that live godly shall suffer persecution. And if you choose not to live godly, you forfeit the right, the privilege, the honor of suffering for Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can you grasp this? You see, sometimes we, we teach the Bible... And it seems like you're only scratching the surface. But sometimes there are deep points that are made that need to get into your little severum up here and, and a couple creases so that you can remember it always. Because it makes the difference in your whole life. So when I asked you, well, will you, will you serve the Lord? He said, well, I'll think about it. Don't you take this lightly. This is an important issue. You see, after you trust Christ as your Savior, this is one of the most important decisions you can make. Will I or will I not? And understand that there is a price to pay. You're exchanging something for something better. If that's a sacrifice, so be it. A sacrifice, in God's Word, is giving up something here for something better there. Don't sound so bad after all, does it? Look up here. Letting this hand represent you and me and a wallet represent all of our sins. We're all sinners. Now God loves us. He hates our sin. And for you and I to pay for the sin, because the wages of sin is death, is eternal separation from God in hell. And so since we're all sinners, we're all condemned, and the whole world is guilty before God. So we're all in the same boat. But God loves us, wants us to go to heaven. And to go to heaven, we have to be perfect, as righteous as God. And none of us are perfect. None of us are righteous. We are all sinners. And God says you cannot save yourself. You can't change yourself. You can't change yourself. You are a sinner, and you can't change that. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, God in the flesh. He came into the world because he loves us. Now, he hates our sin because it separates us from him. So what Christ did for one person, he did for everybody. He took all the sin, paid for it on the cross, and came back from the dead. And God said, if you and I, if we would believe that he did it for us, he would put this payment to our account, and we get to go to heaven on what Jesus Christ did. And because of that, see, you and I can go to heaven because he paid for our sins. And there's no sins to send me to hell. Because he paid for all of them. I have eternal life, eternal union with the Lord. And he said he'll never cast me out, never lose me. And nobody can ever pluck me out of his hands. That is pretty good security. So, was I a fool to accept Christ as my Savior? He kept me out of hell. So I don't think that's been very foolish. I think it's a smart move. When I made up my mind, I'm going to serve the Lord. Doesn't that sound like a smart move also? It seems like a man who doesn't serve the Lord must be a fool. Must be a fool. It's a sign that he's not very wise. Not very intelligent. Not very smart. Because a, a man would be a fool to turn down salvation. And I believe a man would be a fool to turn down service. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. If you're here this morning and have never trusted Christ as your Savior, realize that most of the things that I said was to those who already know the Lord. But if you're here and you say, I, I don't really know where I'm going when I die, I'm not sure. 
then friend, God says that you're lost, but he loves you. He came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And if right where you're sitting, you say, yes, that made sense to me, and I want to trust Christ as my Savior, as my only hope of going to heaven, and preach, I'd like for you to pray for me. Friend, would you just slip your hand up very quickly, put it right back down. Is there anyone at all? Say, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior. I want to be certain of going to heaven when I die. Anyone at all? God loves you so much. Paid for your sins. Will you trust him? If you will, God said he would save you and give you eternal life, and you get to go to heaven. You that have already trusted Christ as your Savior, have you determined in your mind, Lord, I surrender all, not for salvation, but because you are saved. You are his child. You're going to heaven. But you want everything God wants you to have. You want the love. You want the joy. You want to have a purpose in your life. You want the reward that God has, whatever they may be, because you know it will be worth it all. I pray that you will. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for your word that you've given us so we can understand and discern these things. And Father, no doubt there will be some that will make a bad move, a bad exchange. And they'll trade the eternal for the temporary. A few little pleasures in this life for the eternal rewards. We pray, Lord, for each one to have wisdom. Bless this church and these good